when I was teaching, not at Wellesley, at another institution, I had a student ask me a question, one that kind of had me a little shook. He asked me, who is Harriet Tubman? And I was like, what? <laughs> what? But before I could answer the question, he answered it by saying, oh, I remember. She's the woman who wouldn't get off the bus. <laughs> Right? <laughs> no. So, of course, the class kind of pounced on him <laughs> and, you know, did that work for me. Um, but I realized that, like, part of the reason he didn't know the question is because the way we're often taught African American history is through this very narrow, one dimensional lens. And I often make the joke that oftentimes with black history, we are given all of African American history through the story of one great black man and one great black woman. And I think we sort of do this with every single century starting from the 18th century. In the 18th century, I think that one great black man and that one great black woman is Crispus Attucks, the first casualty of the American Revolution, and Phyllis Wheatley, the first woman to ever be published in North America. That one great black man and one great black woman. In the 19th century, it's Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. Again, Frederick Douglass, most people don't know, was the most photographed person of all the 19th century. No one has more photographs of themselves than Frederick Douglass does. But again, it comes down to Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, one great black man and one great black woman. In the 20th century, you can probably guess, it's MLK, and it's Rosa Parks. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks sort of emulate or encapsulate that one great black man and one great black woman. And then in the 20th century, I was thinking really hard, and I think it comes down to Obama and Oprah. <laughs> like, that would be sort of like my, my uh, push to see one great black man and one great black woman. So when I study the abolitionist movement, though, I study hundreds, if not thousands, of different people that were black, white, men, women, old, young, uh, poor, born into slavery, born into freedom, fugitives that had escaped slavery and got into freedom, so many different stories. And I really wanted to let my students know that the abolitionist movement is diverse, that there's no single person you can sort of boil it all down to. But I also wanted to make them understand how how important it was to talk about black abolitionists, to see black leadership at the center of their own movement. When I talk about black abolitionists, and I do this a lot in my book, Force and Freedom, when I talk about the role of violence and the role of force and uh, the overthrow of the institution of slavery, I tell my students why black abolitionists are so important. And the first reason I think is because black abolitionists are the first abolitionists. No one needed to tell enslaved people, you know what, slavery is wrong. Like, <laughs> they knew that, they knew that already, <laughs> and had been pushing for the end of slavery the moment they were in bondage. I think the second reason people need to know why black abolitionists matter is because they connect us to broader traditions of black resistance. Normally when I'm talking about force and violence and you know uh, advocacy within the movement, students say, oh yeah, that's kind of like MLK and Malcolm X, like nonviolence and by any means necessary. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. But a hundred years earlier, that black abolitionists really set the template or the blueprint for understanding how advocacy could work. And then the third reason I talk about black abolitionists is because I'm really trying to combat this myth that the abolitionist movement was a white man's burden, that it was white men who are at the center of this movement, who are leading this movement, who knew what was best for African Americans and were at the forefront. And then lastly, I talk about black abolitionists because they really bore the brunt to pro-slavery violence. Every time there were anti-abolitionist attacks, they destroyed black businesses first black churches next, black schools, black people who were on the street, they were always vulnerable to violence. And I tell my students that black abolitionists are perhaps most important because they never saw the overthrow of slavery as the final step, but as the first step. Black abolitionists really had a two-fold mission, and that was emancipation and equality. They saw emancipation as that first step. We can't stop here. Equality has to be a part of the process. We have to think about what it means to give black people rights and citizenship and protection. And they pushed for all of those things in their movement as well. 
There's a really good quote by Joshua Easton. He says this in 1837. He says, abolitionists may attack slaveholding, but there's a danger still that the spirit of slavery will survive in the form of prejudice after the system is overturned. And then he says, our warfare ought not to be against slavery alone, but against the spirit which makes color of market degradation. The spirit which makes color a mark of degradation. Essentially what he's saying is, you can overturn the system of slavery, but until you deal with white supremacy, until you deal with anti-blackness, you haven't really accomplished much. And what I think we're still grappling to this very day is not the institution of slavery, but the spirit of slavery. So I want to talk about some questions that I grapple with a lot in my research. And that is, what does it mean to have effective change? What does it mean to use violence to complete your goal, to attain your goal, to overthrow the institution of slavery? And when I talk about the black abolitionists and their movement, I realized that they had a rationale when it came to slavery. They said slavery was started through violence. It was sustained through violence. So it only made sense that slavery would be overthrown with violence. And so I asked, well, what does violence mean? How do we make sense of it? And what happens when violence becomes something that's justified, something that's effective in actually replacing one system with another system? Essentially, one of the things I'm asking is, how should oppressed people respond to their oppression? What do you do when you don't have the vote? What do you do when you're not a citizen? What do you do when you don't have the protection of your federal government? How should oppressed people respond to their oppression? The second question I ask is, what's the role of the federal government? What's the role of the state? How should they respond to oppressed people? How should they respond to political dissent, particularly within a democracy? And then lastly, I ask perhaps the most important question, which is how did the powerless procure power? How do the powerless procure power? So I write about how the powerless procure power in my book as well. And I'm going to take you back to like eighth grade history. And we're going to talk about when the first abolitionists get together and they formed their organization in the 1830s. What a lot of people don't realize is that they were pushing this idea of nonviolence and moral suasion and turning their cheek. Their movement really coincided with the second great awakening and this religious revival that people thought that slavery was a sin, that it was evil, that it was crime, and they thought they could convince and persuade slaveholders to relinquish their property, to have sort of like a conviction of heart. And I say in the book that while black abolitionists believed in that, they were only sort of renting those ideas, they never fully owned it. And so when it came to anti-abolitionist riots, and this is a map of anti-abolitionist riots that took place all during the antebellum period, in which black homes and schools were destroyed, as I mentioned before, you see riots taking place in places like Alton, Illinois, or Pendleton, Indiana, or the place like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. You have an anti-abolitionist riot in 1829, 1834, 35, 38, 42, and all of that time, people like William Lord Garrison are saying, turn the other cheek. Don't respond to violence. Don't respond to violence with violence. Even in places where they're like two black people, like Augusta, Maine, <laughs> there are still anti-abolitionist attacks that are happening and the refrain is still the same. Do not use violence. And all of that seems to work kind of well and good until you get to the 1850s. By the time you get to the 1850s, these activists have been at their abolitionist movement for over 20 years, and they've seen no changes. Matter of fact, all the new legislation that has come place has favored slaveholders. In fact, slavery has expanded westward. It has grown. The number of enslaved people are even larger. There's about four million people that are enslaved by the time of the Civil War. So they haven't seen much success. They haven't gotten much traction. And by the time you get to the 1850s, not only are black abolitionists frustrated, but now there's a new law on the horizon. And that new law basically says, it doesn't matter if you're an enslaved person and you ran away and you got to freedom, it doesn't matter if you ran away five days ago, five weeks ago, years ago, you could be living longer in freedom than you were in slavery. Now we have this new fugitive slave law that basically says we can go anywhere and retrieve you if you are fugitive property. 
So when I think about this moment, this expansion of the country, this intense contestation about every state that comes into the nation, California comes into the nation as a free state, Utah, New Mexico are allowing slavery within their boundaries. But this fugitive slave law is another compromise to keep the country from really coming to blows. But it's at the expense of free black people living in the North. So now with the fugitive slave law, the new Mason-Dixon line, is Canada's border. And black people are not having it. They have been left with two options. They can flee to Canada, or they can stay and fight and make a good stand. And that's who I study. I study the black abolitionists who decided to stay and make a good fight of it. Think of people like Martin Delaney, who has this great quote where he says, if an officer searches for fugitives, crosses the threshold of my door, and I do not lay him a lifeless corpse at my feet, I hope the grave may refuse my body a resting place and my righteous heaven, my spirit, a home. He's basically saying, if someone comes to my house looking for fugitives and I don't like murder them <laughs> in response to try to protect them, I hope I don't go to heaven. Like that's, that's major, <laughs> that's major. I also study people like William Parker and his wife Eliza Parker. He says this in 1851. He says, the laws for personal protection are not made for us and we are not bound to obey them. If a fight occurs, I want the whites to keep away. They have a country, a country and may obey the laws, but we have no country. We have no country. And he's saying this in 1851, six years before the famous Dred Scott decision, which said black people have no rights, which a white man is bound to respect. Him and his wife Eliza, they founded the Lancaster Black Self-Protection Society. And they basically said, we will protect fugitive slaves even at the risk of our own lives. And one day, they did just that. There's a story of the Christiana resistance. The story of the Christiana resistance is about four enslaved men that were enslaved in Maryland, and they decided they were going to run away from their master, Edward Gorsuch. They make their way across the Pennsylvania border into the small town of Christiana, where William and Eliza Parker are living. They make it to the Parker's home. They knock on their door. They say, we know about your reputation. We are trying to get to Canada. Will you help us? He says, absolutely. I'll give you shelter in my attic. He gives these four men shelter. And Eliza says, listen, it's not going to be too long before the masters show up. Do you want me to sound the alarm? I will sound the alarm. She was right. Within moments, Edward Gorsuch, his son, his nephew, a U.S. Marshal, and other slave catchers had shown up to the front door of the Parkers to retrieve their stolen human property. And it's at that moment that Eliza says, I'm going to sound the alarm. And she goes up to the attic of their home and she starts to blow a horn to alert the Black Self-Protection Society. And within moments, dozens of men and women show up armed with pitchforks and pistols and farm equipment and rifles, whatever they can to protect these four men from being returned into bondage. And as the story goes, no one really knows who fired the first shot. But at the end of the altercation, Edward Gorsuch, the slaveholder, lay on the ground dead. And this is what's fascinating. William Parker and the four men, the four fugitive men, they make their way all the way to Canada. They're never caught. They're never captured. Eliza as well manages to escape. There's a huge trial about to hold you know, people accountable because the slaveholder has died. They have this massive trial and everyone's acquitted. They don't have enough evidence to prove who did it, who fired these shots. And this was a major turning point in the abolitionist movement because it showed that enslaved and people, fugitive enslaved people, could be protected even to the point of death and that there would be no consequences. I study people in Boston like Lewis and Harriet Hayden. I tell everybody Lewis Hayden's like my historical boyfriend, his wife. <laughs> his wife probably wouldn't like that very much. But I love Lewis Hayden because he was so committed. He was so committed to the cause. There's a story about Lewis Hayden that when you came to his home, he always kept two kegs of gunpowder inside the front door. And every time slave catchers came to his home, knocking on his door, looking for enslaved property, looking for fugitives, he would open the door with a candlestick and he would open it just wide enough for them to see the two kegs of gunpowder and he would give them, you know, a choice. He would say, listen, you can, uh, you can leave in peace or, you know, you can leave in pieces. <laughs> that's, that's the choice. That is the choice today. 
when I read about these stories, I get so empowered when I think about how black people were willing to stand up for their humanity, stand up for their freedom, fight for justice, and even use force and violence to accomplish their goals and accelerate what becomes the Civil War and eventually the overthrow of the institution of slavery. I think about these ads that were posted all over the city of Boston that warned fugitive slaves, that would tell them, hey, listen, there's slave catchers in the town. You want to be aware. You want to be conscious of what's going on. Be ready to receive them whenever they come. And then I think about this great quote by Frederick Douglass, who gives this Ballad of the Bullet speech about 100 years before Malcolm X ever does. And he says this, if speech alone could have abolished slavery, the work would have been done long ago. What we want is anti-slavery government in harmony with our anti-slavery speech, one which will give effect to our words and translate them into acts. For this, the ballot is needed. And if this will not be heard or heeded, then the bullet. We have had enough and we are sick of it. So I think about people, not just Frederick Douglass, but black women as well. Someone like Lucy Statton, who's the first black woman to graduate Oberlin College. She says something so profound before a mixed audience of black and white people, of men and women. She says, slavery is the combination of all crime. It is war. It is war. And then another fellow, fellow abolitionist, she echoes what Lucy Statton says. She's a Quaker and she says this, since slavery was maintained by force, it must be justly opposed in the same way. She added, the question is not whether we shall counsel the slaves to forsake peace and commence war. The war exists already and has been waged unremittingly ever since the slave has been in bondage. For her and many other black abolitionists, slavery was warfare. <clears throat> So then, if slavery is warfare, how should we address it? Well, James McCune Smith, he says this, our white brethren cannot understand us unless we speak to them in their own language. They recognize only the philosophy of force. They recognize only the philosophy of force. One of the things Frederick Douglass said after the Civil War was over, he was talking about the force of events and what it meant to lose hundreds of thousands of lives. No other war fought on American soil has lost as many lives as the Civil War. And he says, you know, these are hard lessons. Why are they hard lessons? Because Americans discovered and accepted more truth in four years of Civil War than they did in 40 years of peace. More truth in four years of Civil War than they did in 40 years of peace. So for me, I have to ask the hard questions as well. I have to ask what could force accomplish that moral suasion could not? And the answer for me is freedom. And the over 250,000 black soldiers that fought in the Civil War and changed the tide to a Union victory.